So on the subject of, of our new exhibition, about a year ago we finished work on a project that was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities to catalog, conserve, and selectively digitize a great many collections of printed and graphic ephemera, which is a rich primary source for research into the lives of ordinary Americans in the 18th and 19th centuries. So after that two-year effort, it seemed only right that we would want to mount an exhibition uh, to showcase the kinds of materials that we have here in such great abundance and that in many cases were unearthed uh, during the course of that, of that project. Two members of our staff, our curator of printed books, Rachel D'Agostino and Erica Piola, uh, stepped forward. Uh, they are also co-directors of our visual culture program. And they expressed a great interest in mounting this exhibition. So they jumped into the job as co-curators and have really done a fantastic job. Uh, anyone now stepping into the gallery, and I know most of you came through there on your way here, you see that you are at risk of encountering sensory overload <laughs> from all the vast array of, of media and messages. So now, to, to give you a little more context about the exhibition, I want to introduce Rachel D'Agostino. And after she speaks for a few minutes, she'll introduce uh, Erica, who will introduce our guest uh, speaker for the evening, so, Rachel. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I promised John I wouldn't take long. I didn't mean to lie. <laughs> so get comfy. And feel free, anybody else can just come on in grab a seat or stand or whatever, it won't be appended. So uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening to hear Dr. Ellen Gruber-Garvey and to learn about the library company's newest exhibition, Remnants of Everyday Life, Historical Ephemera in the Workplace, Street, and Home. Ephemera, by most definitions, is something that is meant to be used for only a very brief period of time, after which it can be and usually is discarded. So how is it that the library company comes to have so many tens of thousands of pieces of ephemera? <laughs> For the most part, we owe this to contemporary collectors of the material, such as Pierre Eugène de Cimetière and John A. McAllister, as well as modern collectors of antiquarian materials, including trustee emeritus Bill Helfand, David Durrett, Michael Zinman, and the late Helen Beitler. Contrary to the good humor teasing sometimes shared among collectors, curators, and dealers, ephemera collecting is not synonymous with premeditated hoarding. <laughs> Faced with such an abundance of material, tickets, menus, billheads, postcards, and so forth, the collector of ephemera must make judicious, discriminating, and far-sighted decisions when developing their collections to choose those pieces that are most representative, that tell the most compelling story, or that provide new insights into the culture from which they emerged. This is no easy task, and we are grateful to the many collectors of ephemera who have taken it on and who have chosen to add their collections to ours. But now the challenge is for us to bring these collections to the awareness of the public and to suggest the kinds of discoveries that can be made by a closer examination of them. Remnants of Everyday Life attempts to do just this to synthesize the great volume of materials to gain control over this massive genre. The exhibition has been divided into sections on mass production technologies and on ephemera found in the workplace, on the street, and in the home. But despite this organization, as John so accurately stated, viewing this exhibition may cause sensory overload. If you find your visual senses overloaded, then as they say, you're doing it right. <laughs> Ephemera is ever-present, per pervasive, relentlessly visual, and sometimes simply overwhelming. It is also a window on the popular and visual cultures of a time, of a place, and of a people. We do hope you enjoy peering into that window as you view the exhibition tonight. And if you find yourselves as fascinated by these materials as we do, please consider joining us on September 19th and 20th for a conference co-sponsored with the Ephemera Society of America called Unmediated History, the Scholarly Study of 19th Century Ephemera. More information on that will be forthcoming. And also in the fall, starting September 16th, 
the exhibition case in the hall just outside this room, these four cases, will showcase works created by members of the Philadelphia Cartoonist Society, along with the pieces of ephemera in our collections that inspired their work. Do come back to see that. And also be sure to visit the Print Center on Latimer Street in Center City, with whom we have also been collaborating and who will be presenting with their own ephemera-related exhibitions in the near future. I will only try to hold your attention for a few more moments before I turn the podium over, but I absolutely must take this time to thank the many, many people who contributed to the creation of this exhibition and its accompanying programming. John Caperton at the Print Center and Diane DeBlois uh, of the Ephemera Society have been um, energized and creative participants in this work from the beginning. The exhibition designer, Barb Barnett, along with Jennifer Rosner, Chief of Conservation, turned the pages and pages of spreadsheets and word documents created by Erica and myself into something you might actually want to see. No easy task. Also, Andrea Krupp and Alice Austin in the Conservation Department were invaluable in mounting this exhibition, both in their skills preparing the materials to be shown and their artistic sensibilities putting everything in its place. I must certainly also thank curatorial assistant and digitization technician Conchetta Barbera for oh so many things, not least of which is the forming of our collaboration with the Cartoonist Society and the oversight of that project. I also need to thank John Van Horn and members of the Board of Trustees for their support and input at many points during this long process. Indeed, the entire staff needs thanks, as no one is immune to the effects of exhibition planning around here, and the support given by the staff to each other is beyond comprehension. Lastly, and most importantly, I personally extend my deepest thanks to my co-curator and co-director, Erica Piola. As most of you know, Erica's tireless energy, coupled with her exhaustive knowledge of all things print, make her something of an unstoppable force. What you might not all know about her is her. <laughs> what you might not all know about is her abundant generosity, her incredible patience with me, and her caring spirit. It has been my complete pleasure to work with Erica in the Visual Culture Program and on this exhibition. So without another moment's delay, I will turn the podium over to Erica Peel. Thank you. Ditto for everything that Rachel said about everyone except me. <laughs> um, but I too just want to thank Rachel for being my co-curator on this exhibition, and I really could not have done it without her. It was really a joint effort, um, and yeah, I'm so pleased to, to see um, the outcome of what we, we did together. So, so thank you to Rachel, and I wish I had more eloquent words to say about you that you just said for me. But I was thinking time is of the essence, and I'm here to introduce our wonderful speaker um, this evening. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ellen Gruber Garvey. Dr. Garvey holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and is professor of English at New Jersey City University. She is editor of Transformations, the Journal of Inclusive Scholarship and Pedagogy, a former president of the New York Metro American Studies Association, and a past recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. She is also the award-winning author of The Admin in the Parlor, Magazines and the Gendering of Consumer Culture, and has written several works on the history of scrapbooks, including her most recent book, Writing with Scissors, American Scrapbooks from the Civil War to the Harlem, Harlem Renaissance. Her talk tonight, which I think it says scrapbook history, was permanent ephemera scrapbook history previously, um, draws from this work and examines newspaper clippings, scrapbooks, as historical records of the reading practices of persons from all classes of society, from the famous like Mark Twain and Susan B. Anthony to the ordinary working man and woman. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Garvey. Hi. Well, thank you very much, Erica, and thank you, Rachel, for this fabulous exhibit. I hope you've had a chance to look at, at, at the exhibit, and I hope you haven't, you will soon, with its wealth of printed matter, drab and colorful, from all kinds of, of, of period, from all kinds of, of um, enterprises. And I, if you have looked, then you probably have noticed already that the ephemera includes both items that go into scrapbooks and the scrapbooks themselves. Now, there are many different kinds of scrapbooks and may reflect the 19th century engagement with cheap printed matter. 
So we see in this one, for example, colorful advertising cards. They were free and pretty, and children collected them and saved them. They used the scrapbooks that they bought or received as gifts. Children and young people made scrapbook page arrangements that allowed them to play with these ideas of advertising and what it meant to long for goods that were part that were, were offered in the ads and to fantasize with them and how they were going to live with them. Um, sometimes people made cloth books for children out of the trade cards, seed catalogs, and things like that. Sort of like today's board books, fairly indestructible but for babies. Um, and of course, making them preoccupied children, so it was a good idea to, you know, it, it helped to um, organize your household to, to set up the kids to make some scrapbooks too. So there were, and, and, and we've seen other ways that, that kids can play out uh, their fantasies about, um, about goods with these advertising cards. They might be as simple as t taking pleasure in the abundance of color that the cards offer, and offered for free, of course, um, and surrounding an advertisement with co calling cards of friends and family, which were also pretty and abundant, could also be a way of, of speaking, of spelling out your desires that you would have. This life with a sewing machine surrounded by your friends. Um, so, all of those were made of printed ephemera. Uh, and sometimes people would use those, those kinds of printed things to represent their own families. In the era before postcards, for example, we see uh, this wonderful baby scrapbook from Winterthur where somebody has cut up lots of advertising cards and created a kind of explosion of babies or a celebration of babies of this wonderful cut, or perhaps of a specific baby. We don't know. So, Often, scrapbooks get separated from the information about them, and that makes them complicated and difficult to work with, or frustrating, as you might have noticed with that wonderful, gigantic scrapbook made, uh, it seems to be pasted onto newspapers in the exhibit, which has no provenance information. So who was saving those salacious pictures? We do not know. Um, now, scrapbooks like these, like this one, were, in a sense, souvenirs of shopping. And this souvenir element moved to the fore as scrapbooks uh, morphed into memorabilia books. So the, a big fad for college scrapbooks appe appeared that were made by both men and women um, blossomed, especially with snapshot, when snapshot photography came in in the 1890s. So this scrapbook from Amherst College has not only a pair of sunglasses, uh, very sort of smoked glasses, I guess they would be called at the time, and a handkerchief, and a post, and a, not a postcard, but a, a picture card, and various other bits of memorabilia, a class ticket. All of those are kinds, of, and, and there are also ads from local businesses, ways of, of saving information about their career at college. Kids, you know, young people were away from home for the first time, perhaps. <laughs> This was a way of marking that relationship. And there's a wonderful book on these older mem on memorabilia scrapbooks that some of you may know by Jessica Helfham, um, who I believe is related to Bill. <laughs> um, so I can tell you about other kinds of scrapbooks like these. Um, oops. Oh, I, you, you ended up not using the new one? Uh, I used Allison. the one on your bundle. You did. Okay. Um, so, I'm gonna, uh, but I'm gonna now turn to a very different kind of scrapbook, and that is the scrapbooks made by <coughs> made out of newspaper clippings. And these are the ancestor. Actually, I'm sorry. I'm gonna jump ahead and see if I can just find these other ones because I did have. There we go. Sorry, I, I put them in the wrong place. I'm just making a, a change at the very last minute. This is what always happens. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but so I could tell you about lots of other kinds of scrapbooks. These are another kind of way that people played with scrapbooks. They made houses out of them. Each page would be a room. In this case, this is a, a school room. So you can see they used the maps at the top to uh, to um, elaborate what what to be in a school room. They've cut these pictures out of magazines. They've got um, other pieces taken from trade cards. So. 
there were lots of ways that people used scrapbooks. Another kind of offshoot memorabilia books is um, people used, made scrapbooks from their political campaigns. In this case, an anti-suffrage campaign conducted by <laughs> Ethel Leatherby around 1915. Um, she, she had great ephemera in her scrapbook, by the way. Um, they seemed to have had a lot of money to put into the business. So um, this was, um, I don't want to leave the government in the hands of inexperienced women. On the other hand, other women felt otherwise. Alice Dunbar Nelson, who was uh, uh, the widow, I mean, a complicated story, but uh, the ex-wife widow of Paul uh, Lawrence Dunbar, was also a suffrage speaker. And she gave, was part of a campaign in Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh, uh, to, to win the vote. And she saved memorabilia as well to document her work in the campaign. But um, so there's plenty more of these kinds of scrapbooks to talk about, but I'm going to turn to a different kind, and that is these newspaper scrapbooks. Um, we hardly think about it anymore today, but basically anybody in the 19th century made a newspaper clipping scrapbook. So Abraham Lincoln made scrapbooks. Frederick Douglass made scrapbooks. Other speakers and statesmen did so. And Frederick Douglass uh, suggested to his readers that uh, uh, before the war, that they ought to make scrapbooks as well. Um, uh, Susan, uh, Susan B. Anthony made scrapbooks, and um, uh, actors like Sarah Bernhardt made scrapbooks, writers like uh, Jack London and Mark Twain made scrapbooks. And here you can see, I'll talk a little bit about his own scrapbook later, but here you can see him working at a scrapbook in this cartoon. Um, so, but frankly, this list of, of uh, famous people is just to take advantage of your interest in celebrities. Because much more important is that people in positions of powerlessness in the 19th century could use, the, what we might look a couple of years ago, we were calling the 99%, um, made a place for themselves and their communities. They could use their scrapbooks to articulate their readings and their understandings. They took material from they took their material from mass-produced printed matter, and they sifted, they analyzed, and they recirculated it to create something that was often intimate and <coughs> meaningful to themselves and their communities. So, let's think about 19th-century newspapers for a minute. They were cheap. They were tantalizingly valuable. They seemed like they had all this wonderful information in them. But what were you going to do with them? They didn't have indexes. You could just stack them up in your house. But eventually, that was a little, you couldn't find anything in them once you did that. So well, rather than be jammed in by stacks of newspapers, thousands of Americans made these made newspaper clippings scrapbooks. Um, and I've been looking, reading hundreds of these around the country for the past 10 years. So I've gotten a sense of what they're, they're like. So I'm going to give you an overview of these newspaper clipping scrapbooks. And then so that we can see some of the unexpected uses to which they were put, I'm going to focus in on some scrapbooks made <coughs> by African Americans and African American activists uh, with a special focus on those made in Philadelphia, since we're here. So these scrapbook makers, what black journalist Gertrude Bustiel Mossel called unwritten histories. Um, so this is just to get to an overview of these clipping scrapbooks. Uh, the Civil War was a real watershed moment for newspaper reading. Um, both North Northerners and Southerners were avid to read the newspaper. And they read it with passionate intensity. The fact that you could get news by telegraph was immensely alluring. You could find out what was happening with your friends and relatives on the battlefield very quickly. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Uh, senior <coughs> talks about being drawn out in the evening by divine right of tele telegraphic dispatches to read the newspaper. And so people would gather to do that. Um, now, think about, and then that, and that leads to saving it. You might think about 9-11. How many people here saved the newspaper after 9-11? Yeah, lots and lots of Americans did. 
the sense of saving um, it, the record of a momentous <coughs> event and saving the way you learned about it, what it was that you connected with as you read it. So this is not only a watershed moment for, nine, for, scrap, for newspaper reading, but for scrapbook making. So again, that, you have hundreds or possibly thousands of newspaper clipping scrapbooks made during the Civil War. Now, what did they save? Well, people on both sides um, saved the, the information that said their side was winning. Um, they made what you might think of as ideal newspapers out of their, uh, in their scrapbooks. A lot of people saved poetry. So, and some things, because of the exchange system and because of the way um, all printed articles and poems move through the press, through different, different uh, newspapers, the same poem was often printed in many newspapers and even north and south. So in this case, the scrapbook on the left is made by a, a Boston abolitionist doctor who began collecting the poetry that moved him after his son died in battle in the Civil War. Uh, he, collect, he made the collection, he made the scrapbook itself about 14 years later and he remarks on the poems and looking at them back, looking back at them. He says, wow, these are pretty awful, aren't they? But they moved me at the time, so I've got to save them. Um, and the other scrapbook is from a southern, uh, from an, a Confederate woman who saved the same poem. It's about a soldier dying in the hospital. Each of them believed it was written by someone on their side. It was actually by the southerner. And, and so there's this sense of saving the poems that mattered to them, that moved them, that seemed to speak to their, um, their feelings at the time. Another way that people used scrapbooks was as a tool to keep track of propaganda. So this is a, an image from a, uh, an autobiographical novel written by a Union sympathizer living in the South during the Civil War. He saved up clippings of <coughs> of stories that said the South was winning, and then he would follow up a few days later when it would be, when it went, so, or that a certain battle was won by the South. A few days later, another little story would appear in the newspaper that would say, no, no, that actually didn't happen. No, it wasn't, it didn't go so well as we thought. So he would save them up side by side, which was quite uh -huh. seditious. Um, and so here he's showing it to a friend, a fellow sympathizer, but of course, that kind of pairing of, that kind of gleaning of real um, information about what was going on by noticing discrepancies in the newspaper was dangerous. So here he is hiding the scrapbook in the safe so he won't be lynched. Um, so what did they paste their newspaper clipping scrapbooks into? Well, some people bought elaborate scrapbooks, beautiful bindings, and, um, and especially made for the purpose. Mark Twain, in addition to, uh, to writing books, dabbled in inventions. And one of his inventions was a book that he did not write, a book that was, it was a self-pasting scrapbook. It had strips of glue on the, on the paper, and you would moisten it with a sponge and slap down your clipping. And it shows the advantage, the disadvantages of using the traditional scrapbook here. You can see that you get stuck in the glue, you, the scissors are all over the place, everybody is in chaos, and worst of all, profanity results. So he, he uh, marketed his new, old, new style scrapbook as, as one of the same on profanity and cause people to not do that. Um, so, but most people did not, and here's a, actually a, a lovely cover of one of the scrapbooks, and you can see that a cherub is holding aloft the self-pasting scrapbook <laughs> while kicking aside the glue pot. <laughs> <laughs> but most people didn't buy special blank books. They might use repurposed ledgers to paste their clippings into. The, in this case, a girl was using a, a Civil War scrap uh, ledger. Or they might, as we saw, as you can see out in the exhibit here, um, even take sheets of newspapers and, and paste the, the clippings, or in this case, cards, onto them. Um, 
But more often, they did things like take this, the patent office report. That the, your congressman would send you these various things for free, the patent office report, the agricultural reports. And they were very nice, substantial looking books. They looked great on the bookshelf. And so they kind of dignified these scrappy little clippings that you've been collecting. And you could paste your clippings into them. So agricultural reports were good for that, too. Um, they were bulky. They looked great. And um, this meant, essentially, that the US government was subsidizing scrapbook. <laughs> so one of these repurposed books led me into this research. I was in a used bookstore in Massachusetts, and the proprietor, who was a retired English professor, uh, Doris Abramson, handed me this book of Puritan sermons, um, Saints Everlasting Rest by Richard <coughs> Baxter, who's a Oliver Cromwell's ch uh, uh, pr uh, chaplain. So I thought, why is she handing me a book of Puritan sermons? Um, well, when I opened it, I discovered that the first thing in it was not the sermons, but a story by Mary, Wil Mary Wilkins Friedman. That is, uh, it's called um, The Revolt of Mother. I don't know if anyone, does anyone know it? Okay. It's a story in which um, a woman who has been living in a really rundown, crap, crummy house um, has been begging her husband for a better place to live for decades, and he won't do it. And finally, he goes away to buy some cows, and he, oh, and he keeps putting up other buildings, you know, out, out of the farm, uh, barns and farm buildings. So he goes away to buy some cows. She moves the family into the barn, which is much more spacious and clean and you know, watertight than the house she's been living in. So I thought, well, she's paid this, this farm woman who owned the scrapbook took her clippings from the, the farm papers, and she pasted them into a binding that was much more spacious and capacious and, and nicer <laughs> than what they had been in. And I, I was completely hooked after that, <laughs> of course. So, as I looked more, I saw that these scrapbooks were also the ancestors of our web bookmarks, our favorites lists, of Google, of blogging. They're ways of making a breadcrumb trail back to find our way back through print, and also of sharing responses to media. So newspaper clipping scrapbooks allowed readers to save, manage, and reprocess information. Another story that kind of another research story uh, that tells a little bit about how people made use of these scrapbooks. I was at the University of Nebraska. Um, I was looking through this typical farm woman's scrapbook. It has, you know, remedies for scab, for scaly rashes in your children, and what to do about various diseases of sheep, and um, poems next to that, and some recipes, and this and that. Um, so I thought, okay, here she is. She's going to be home. She's homesteading in Nebraska, and that's what she's collecting. Um, so I assumed that, that that was who Frances Smith was, and then I checked her dates, and it turned out that when she made the scrapbook, she was a Mount Holyoke graduate, a school teacher, living in the East, and she wasn't married, had no children. So what was she up to? She was, um, she was doing what people do now on Pinterest. She was making a kind of aspirational scrapbook, a collection of the work, of the materials she thought she would need, when she did go to Nebraska and, and homestead it and eventually became Willa Cather's Aunt Frank. Um, so she was sending provisions ahead to her future self. Instead of taking a stack of newspapers west, she had a portable reading device. So ordinary <coughs> people's scrapbooks tell us, like Frances Smith Cather's, open a window into the lives and thoughts of people who did not respond to the world with their own writing. Now, I said we'd look at the newspaper reading of the 99%, and that kind of implies a little bit of political activism, so that, that's going to take us there a bit. Um, so I'm going to focus now on scrapbooks made by African Americans uh, who are particularly concerned with African American history and political position. These readers, armed with scissors, used scrapbooks to articulate their concerns and to teach others with them, to reach others with them. So in my research, I discovered several African-American men who were prodigious makers of scrapbooks in the late 19th and early 20th century. Joseph W.H. Cathcart, of whom I have no picture and would love to find one because he seems to have been a very dramatic guy with his 
I sort of think of him like Walt Whitman with his shirt half open and long plates down his back. Um, he created 130 scrapbooks. He was a janitor. Um, his friend, William Henry Dorsey, made almost 400. Um, L.S. Alexander Gumby in New York made over 100. And there were dozens of others. Black women made scrapbooks as well, but I haven't found any um, who made quite such large collections of them, or they haven't, those collections haven't survived or not in the archives. So my book goes into their work in much more depth, but I want to show you three ways that African, four ways that African Americans used scrapbooks. The first was using the language of juxtaposition to analyze media. The second, speaking back to media. Third, saving black history. And finally, sharing that history in the black community. So these scrapbook makers often put the white press. Uh, there was a small black press, but the daily press was white. And the white press was often hostile to black people. Um, and yet they're using it. So African Americans saved and critiqued the white press using what I'm calling the language of juxtaposition, um, placing materials that articulate contrasts and comparisons. Charles Hunter of North Carolina, for example, um, offers a, a really vivid example of this. He has two clippings side by side. Um, and he pasted his, his clippings down, by the way, on old paper bags. And then he pasted the bags into uh, roll books, because he was a school principal, so he had old school books, uh, you know, uh, attendance books. Um, and he, they're very scrappy looking, but they're very articulate. So he has on one page, next to each other, a, a clipping about um, a black man accused of raping a white teenager. The man is jailed, but he's hauled, there's no trial, he's hauled out of jail, he's, he's lynched, he's killed. Next to that clipping, an incident a few months later, a white man accused of white, raping a white teenager is, is taken to trial, he has a lawyer, there's a long trial, he's acquitted. And so Hunter, putting these two clippings together, is pointing to the injustice of the situation, and he's also pointing to the fact that the white newspaper paid no attention to these, this contrast. He's making it visible. Um, so this language of juxta juxtaposition, the possibility of articulating a, a, a critique without writing a word is um, essential to scrapbook making. Now, this is William Henry Dorsey, and you may have heard of him. He used his 400 scrapbooks. Uh, William, uh, I'm sorry, W.E.B. Du Bois used Dorsey's 400 scrapbooks in writing The Philadelphia Negro. And more recently, the, the historian Roger Lane, in his magisterial William Dorsey's Phil Philadelphia and Ours, drew on Dorsey's scrapbooks for the, to, put it, for, to put that work together. Um, and Dorsey, uh, well, there's a lot more to say about Dorsey, but I'll just focus in on one of his scrapbooks. It's one of my favorites. It's small. It's 50 pages. It's called Colored Centenarians. And it's pasted over a government report, the sinking funds of Philadelphia, I think it is. Um, and in it are over 200 newspaper accounts that he found over the course of four decades uh, about black people who were said to be over 100 years old. Um, the scrapbook leads off with a four-line obituary clipping. He pasted it along on the page and then drew a box around it. And it reads, Old Katie Jackson, a colored woman over 100 years of age, died at Pottstown last Saturday. She saw General Washington in the year 1790, when on his way to suppress the whiskey insurrection. Below this 1866 article, he wrote, the above was my great-grandmother on my mother's side, William Henry Dorsey. Mm -hmm. Now, when people nowadays put interesting information about their family into a scrapbook, they're very likely to surround it with photographs, but lots of other information about their family. Dorsey mm -hmm. did not. He put his great-grandmother at the head of a long line of black centenarians. He made a new history for her. So, and you can see, I can barely make it out, it's a pencil, his uh, index to uh, his scrapbook. He enjoyed indexing. Now, taking these items from an often hostile white press 
where their isolated curiosities, Dorsey created a narrative that made African American history, African Americans visible in the history of the nation, the founding of the nation. One clipping, for example, is of Lizzie Gray, enslaved in Africa and kept on a British ship during the American War of Independence. Then the country is freed, she's let out of the ship into slavery. Now, in the context of this scrapbook, that rises to the fore in the newspaper, it's invisible. <coughs> Dorsey's friend, William Henry, uh, Joseph W. H. Cathcart, made huge scrapbooks. <coughs> Sorry, a few more Dorsey pictures. Um, and this one, you can, he, he made, they're, they're quite large. And here you can see, by the great scrapbook maker, <laughs> J.W.H. Cathcart. Um, so he took a great deal of pride in his scrapbooks, obviously. And he, his are densely covered. Their, their pages are, are stiff because they're so full of clippings. And you can barely make out what's on, underneath. Very rarely can you see what's coming. He, his scrapbooks, and they, he covered all sorts of topics, the Civil War, the Freeman's Bureau, the um, uh, discrimination against people on street, black people on street cars, and his, but his, his scrapbooks drew attention to the history of black people in the white press in a whole different way. Now, he worked as a janitor in a building on Walnut Street near the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, not that far from here, uh, where he also lived. And he had these bookcases full of enormous scrapbooks. Mm -hmm. Reporters, I guess because they were nearby at the stock exchange, came to visit him and saw his collection. And, and they, they wrote about it. So these are reporters in the white press. It helps that his collection, of course, dignified the work of reporters. They, their old newspapers were no longer wrapping fish or being thrown out or, you know, in other less, less uh, polite usages. Um, but rather, they were being pasted into these books, and they were, they were valued and held. So reporters wrote about him quite a lot. Respectfully, one reporter praised the great variety of subjects showing at once the broad range of the collector's tastes and the wide scope of the journalism of the past quarter of a century. So his scrapbooks intervened in the white press by inspiring stories about them in the white press. Um, and then the, the stories about them were reprinted all, all over the country. They appeared in St. Louis, they in Los Angeles, and then they got reprinted elsewhere. So they taught the readers of those white papers that black people had a substantial history. And they taught the black readers of those papers that about his techniques as well. So because these beautifully bound volumes looked so orderly and businesslike on the, sh on the shelves, as orderly as the volumes in the nearby offices, they had a particular authority. And um, he, he displaced one kind of official report with his report, his saving of all of the uh, congressional reports on uh, Reconstruction, for example. That kind of displacement is a little like what the, um, the farm woman who displaced the Puritan sermons with her stories about women, women's work on the farm. There's, at the very least, he didn't value what was underneath. She didn't value this, what was underneath. Whether it's as pointed as a critique, we don't know. Other black scrapbook makers mixed material commemorating their own lives with news of important issues in the black community. So Charles Turner, who was a civil servant and political party activist in St. Louis, uh, collected programs for musicales and cakewalks that he had attended and participated in. Um, so not so different from the Amherst student who collected handkerchiefs and, and other and tickets for lectures um, and, and memorabilia. Um, but these souvenirs are right up next to news reports of lynchings and articles on the suppression of the black vote, as though any record of enjoyment was shadowed by grimmer news. So we don't know whether Charles Turner shared his scrapbooks, but William Dorsey definitely did. He shared his black scrapbooks with the black community. Sorry, let me back up to that. In in a, a room in his house, first on Dean Street, on Locust Street, and then on Dean Street, that he referred to as Dorsey's Museum, and people would come and, and look at his artwork and his books and his scrapbooks. Um, 
he also he was very involved in history in general. He was part of the uh, American Negro Historical Society, which whose, whose materials are now next door at the Pennsylvania. Many, some of them, a few uh, at the Pennsylvania Historical Society, not much survived. Um, in a later generation, L. S. Alexander Gumby, a gay man who knew everyone in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, kept a salon and there people could come and read his he's making and read his uh, 150 scrapbooks on black life. You could see the scrapbooks up on the shelf in the back there. Uh, and that's gonna be in, in the flowered bathroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So here he is making his scrapbooks. Um, now, these black scrapbook makers wrested black history from a hostile press. <coughs> Other groups, like women's rights activists and as scrapbook makers, did, did so as well. Um, all as ways of, of learning to interrogate the press and to use that information in, in conducting their campaigns. All of these scrapbook makers created their works from mass-produced printed materials. Although each of the items in their scrapbooks were produced, was produced in, co in quantity, the scrapbooks they made are unique and irre irreplaceable. They leave us a record of what people saw or read, the papers that passed through their hands, and more important, how they read them, what they meant to them. Scrapbooks look like books. They're long-lasting and prestigious, but they're stuffed with ephemeral materials scrappy clippings and paper oddments. 19th century scrapbook makers pulled materials from newspapers to pass and, and to save and to pass along. They honored their own choices of reading by putting them in these hefty volumes that spoke of value and importance mm -hmm. and looked good on the shelf. So from Mark Twain to Abraham Lincoln to Susan B. Anthony, um, from African-American janitors to farm, farm women to abolitionists to Confederates, People cut out and pasted down their reading. People saved what was important to them in, their ephemeral, in, in, this, in this ephemeral material that passed through their hands. When we look at their scrapbooks, we read over their shoulders, enter their thoughts in the democratic archives they created <coughs> in their scrapbooks. 